council members. Um, so my plan at this point is obviously let's do attendance before Jean Marie gets talking anymore. Uh, Mr. Hamill, are you here? I am here. Mr. Johnson, are you here? Here. And Ms. Katerina is here. So we're all uh, present and accounted for. Also, I have Mr. Hall, Mr. Gallagher, and Mr. Chase um, here also. Uh, I, I forgot to look at the agenda. Do I have mi minutes that we're supposed to approve? Yes. OK. I didn't get a chance to look at them. Does anyone have any questions on them? And if not, can I have a, a approval? So moved. Second. Um, let's take a vote on that. Uh, Mr. Hamill? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Yes. And that's an aye for Ms. Katerina. All right, that being said, um, what I do for folks who may not be um, up to date on how I run the ordinance meetings, um, the, I'm afraid the school teacher in me comes out a bit, but we do uh, three minutes each of comments from people in the audience who may wish to speak on anything that's on the agenda. I limit it to 15 minutes total unless obviously I can be flexible with that um, but let's get started and I'm going to be a little different today does anyone wish to speak to the fireworks ordinance let's hear from fireworks ordinance folks first if you would raise your hand and I will have Mr. Gallagher uh, bring them up sure we'll have uh, I think I saw uh, Gretchen McKeska first so yeah Gretchen, you should be, if you unmute yourself, you should be able to speak. All right, can you hear me? We yes, can. go ahead, okay. Gretchen. Okay, sorry, I've been on endless meetings, so. <laughs> <laughs> you think I would have it down now? Okay, so my name is Gretchen McKeska. I am at 14 Houghton Street at Higgins Beach. Uh, I just enjoyed my first season as a um, plover and lease turn monitor. I can also note that I have um, owned and lived in this house in different capacities in different ways for 30 years. So I am not new to the block here, but I have never done the plover and um, lease turn monitoring before. And the reason I'm bringing this up, I spent, um, Glennis Shabbat is our volunteer coordinator. She is my direct next door neighbor. So we were able to coordinate on everything very carefully. And um, as you probably know, Audubon um, calls for our hours. Um, I, I logged in about 200 hours I put down. And you know, you might say that's a lot. I don't wanna take all my time to say why that was so many hours, but basically we had to babysit a lot of the plovers and the lease turns. So as far as the ordinance goes, um, I had Saturday nights and other times I went out as well, but Saturday night, as you know, 4th of July was a Saturday night. This was um, really in hot bird season that time, early July. We have little baby chicks running all over the beach. The, the lease turns in particular are very sensitive to um, all kinds of disturbances. Um, Glennis had let me know in a previous year, um, the lease turn colony had um, been abandoned once because of a kite. Mm -hmm. um, we had um, a lot of fireworks on the beach. They all had were permitted. We worked very closely with our police, but the thing is, even though people had a permit to set off these they were um, on the street. So technically they really weren't legal, but neither here nor there, even if they would have been in their yards, they're, you know, literally like, th this isn't even 50, you know, 100 yards from these, the nest, maybe it's a hundred yards from the nest. And these are, you know, th we have the largest, there's only two least turn populations in the state. If we're serious about keeping these birds, there's no way we can have these fireworks by this bird population. It just, you know, we're, we might as well just abandon, you know, having this idea because it's, first of all, it's, it's almost like not, um, it's not even rational. 
And it's not fair also even to, you know, us monitors. I had to call the police. It was so stressful. I mean, the, the entire bird colony I saw leave that night. And, you know, I called up the police. I called up Glennis. I'm like, okay, they left. Luckily, most of them came back the next day. They did not abandon the colony because at that point in time, they were all babies and um, eggs. So we would have lost that entire, you know, one of two colonies. In the reason that these colonies are here now is that, you know, they're moving north with um, the climate change. So we now have, you know, enjoy this colony that we had in the past. The colony, it also um, had another incident on fireworks in the end of September. Uh, illegal fireworks went off and actually the colony um, left. And that was the last we saw of them. Still, vigilants that were um, just learning how to fly. So my proposal is: um, you can't have these fireworks if you're going to have an endangered species on the beach, particularly our least tern. And um, we have to make it that uh, they can't be on that part of the beach. More ideally, that we should set something up that there really are no fireworks allowed in Higgins Beach with all the birds um, okay. that populating the area. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Gretchen. All right. Next, I see Miss Bristol. Allison, you should be all set to talk. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Thank you very <laughs> much. Thank you. At, uh, we had a little difficulty at long range planning on yes. Friday, so I, I guess we're all up and running now. But thank you. First, thank you to the committee for taking the time to review this once again. And just to reiterate some of the things that I included in my email, uh, when we spoke in April, I think the conversation kind of veered off to the difficulty in enforcing no fireworks on the beach. And in fact, I have to say the uh, police department has done a bang up job, if you pardon the pun, in the last, <laughs> the last couple of years in keeping the fireworks off the beach. And this year for the first time, they actually actively uh, shut down displays where people hadn't filled out the intention form. So that was great. But so what the concern is, aside from the plovers and the lease turns, is that um, you know the fireworks are legal on private property, and the lots down here are only 50 by 100, and a lot of the houses are so maxed out on their lots that you're literally a few feet from your neighbors. So um, what what the recommendation is is to codify a distance from structure provision in the ordinance, not, not just in the fireworks guidelines, but in the ordinance itself. And uh, what, where I uh, picked up my numbers was first phantom, the, the um, respect your neighbor guidelines, the last uh, bullet point is carefully follow the safety instructions provided by the seller of the fireworks. And of course, phantom probably doesn't sell all the fireworks that are being shot off but I send everyone a link to their guidelines, which is a minimum of 150 feet for aerial items from buildings, vehicles, overhead obstructions, and shrubbery. And I've worked with fireworks professionally. So uh, what I would say to that distance is it doesn't take wind or dry conditions under consideration. And Phantom has a sign out front in front of their retail location that says no discharge for 300 feet. So I think that might be a safer um, distance to work with. Um, and then also the, the plover and the lease turn concern, I sent everyone a link to the um, uh, IFW website where their recommendation is to avoid fireworks within a mile of nesting areas. Uh, a couple other little things I picked up, uh, the piping plover ordinance actually has an inconsistency that allows for fireworks on the beach from April 1st until the chicks are fledged. So hopefully we could get that cleaned up um, at the same time. And um, so just, you know, summary to amend the consumer fireworks ordinance to add a distance from structure provision as section 4C 
at the very minimum 150 feet, ideally a minimum of 300 feet, to consider the IFW's spe uh, endangered species recommendations. Uh, I also added uh, to keep in keeping with the state fire marshal regulation, they have in their regulations um, sky lanterns as prohibited products in Maine. And uh, there was one down here a uh, couple of years ago, so it wouldn't hurt to add that to the ordinance. And then also to update piping plover ordinance so it's uh, consistent with the fireworks ordinance. And uh, okay. my videos, you know, you can see, see for yourself with the videos I sent. And yeah. I truly, I thank you very much for taking the time to look at this. Thank you, Allison. Yep. Uh, looks like we have a Jenny. Pakraduni. me. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, Jenny. Go ahead. Hi. I'm so I I monitored with uh, Gretchen and Glennis um, for the piping plover and lease turn recovery project with IFW and Audubon this summer. Um, I also I put in 220 hours. Um, specifically up in the habitat area, there was, as Gretchen mentioned, a lot of uh, direct babysitting, um, a lot of gentle education of beachgoers, making sure beachgoers were, were comfortable being there, but also aware of the birds and just um, alerting them to the birds because they're so small um, and nest on the ground, as we all know. Um, I also had a number of uh, experiences where I had to call, I had to call twice uh, for fireworks, um, not on the beach, but just behind the beach in the White Sands area um, where I actually currently reside. Um, and I spent pretty much the whole entire summer um, monitoring in the White Sands area. Um, I know a number of the homeowners in the area who are, um, who are who are supportive of the um of the project and it you know the the fireworks were basically right out in the street and there were several um there were several incidents where they just kept going and it was clearly really distressing to the birds um i also witnessed a large portion of the colony leave for you know, 20 minutes to half an hour, which was hard stopping for me as a, as a volunteer. Um, I did see some of them return and then we did have a, a good turnout, but it is clearly extremely distressing. And I, I agree with everything that was just previously said. And I really appreciate all of those points being brought up um, uh, and getting the, the legislation cleaned up, especially around the, the plovers and the, um, fireworks legislation during the nesting season because the nesting season is not that long and it is such a delicate time. Um, and we really have, you know, thanks to Glennis and, and to all the volunteers, we've made so much progress with recovering these two species. Um, so I, I don't think it's a lot to ask. And I also, I also do think it's, uh, the houses are very close together and it's, it would be nice for neighbors to not really have to put up with quite quite so much um but i just wanted to to put my two cents in and and to note that it really is incredibly distressing to wildlife um to have fireworks that close to uh to the nesting area and we don't we don't even know the full impacts um especially when the birds are still in the eggs so um, all of these points are, are really important. And thank you so much for taking the time to hear my comments. Thank you, Jenny. Oops, I turned my timer off here. Sorry, hold on. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, is there anyone else who wishes to speak on the fireworks? I see Glennis, if you wanna talk, put your hand. Yep, here we go, Glennis would like to speak. Okay. Hey, Glennis. Hello. Um, so really there are two issues here. One is allowing fireworks in our high density neighborhood um, and really any high density neighborhood in town, Higgins, Eastern Village, condo developments, et cetera. 
where the buildings are so close together uh, that it creates a major impact on the neighborhood. And it also is a safety concern. Um, we have debris landing on roofs, on vehicles, on yards, and there's uh, no safety precautions at all when consumers uh, uh, shoot off fireworks. Um, there are no fire extinguishers around. Uh, there's no one monitoring the spectators or the young children. So being in a high density area, that is probably the first issue. And then the second is the, the endangered species. And fireworks presently are not allowed on the beach and our reserve officers do a fabulous job of keeping the fireworks from uh, being set off on the beach. However, the present ordinance does allow fireworks to be set off on properties that are right adjacent to the nesting area. Um, and it is legal to do that. And so that really should um, have a change in the ordinance um, to protect the birds. And we always have birds nesting at Higgins on the 3rd and 4th of July. Yeah. So it's, it's every year. And so this, this year it was more of an issue because we had one of the least turn colonies. We had, I think, 140 nests of least turns um, and five nests of piping plovers. Um, so we have the two issues here at Higgins, the high density and the endangered species. Um, and I agree what um, Jenny and Gretchen um, shared with you. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Glennis. Um, and, and you muted yourself, G. Marie. Yeah, here we are. God, I can't handle myself this late in the afternoon. Sorry. Um, I want to thank everyone, uh, who has spoken, uh, on the fireworks ordinance. I know this has been an issue for a while and I know I've put it off, put it off, put it off. And I'm going to beg the pardon of Dan Bacon and Rocky, who are sitting waiting for the GMO. Um, but can we talk very briefly, Ken and Dawn, about the fireworks? I will. I will tell folks right up front that we need. I, I feel that it may need some more work. I know some of you have sent me emails. I think I got five emails in addition to the people speaking today, but. <clears throat> I I'm feel very strongly that this is an issue that I, I know you're not going to like this. It's going to have to wait um, until early next year um, because we do have some time to do it and do it right. But I do want Ken and Dawn to weigh in on this if they would. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, I will. Because uh, I heard, to me, it sounds like just two points of adjustment, right? Distance yeah. from the beach and distance from the neighbors. And it's regardless of whether you're dense or not or what part of town you right. live in, right? I mean, right. ordinances for everybody. I, I just want to make sure I uh, understand that legally, boy, I miss LePage, don't you? This was this was <laughs> his legacy. Legally, it's what, July 3rd, 4th, December 31st, and the 1st, correct? Yeah. Those are the legal dates that we've got. So I think one of the uh, one of the guest speakers mentioned September. So I mean that would typically just be a violation of the existing law. That, right. That'd be a police matter, right? So how difficult is it to just adjust this from distance to the beach, from the beach, and distance from your neighbors? I mean, is how much work would be involved with that? That's that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. But those are two good questions. Um, Dawn, and then I'm going to ask Glenn or Tom, did you want to weigh in? You were a hold. Okay, Dawn, go ahead. I was just going to build on uh, on Ken's points there, which you know I agree with. But I also heard the the, comp the issues around plovers would put it out completely for that area if you have to be a, a mile away from right. plover when they're nesting so so you know it, I, and I agree I mean it's really only four days that that we're dealing with here for consumer fireworks um, so it's not you know it's not the whole year it's just a couple of days but I understand the concerns that people have raised and I you know I mean I live in a beach area and I've seen that 
Japanese lanterns flying over my house mm -hmm. and, and a dry <laughs> time of the year, and other things like that. So I, I mean, I share the concerns, uh, and also it can be you know kind of a wild scene uh, down on the beaches uh, as well. So so I just. And there, you know, if, if you were to pick one of these, for example, the plover rule, that would eliminate them all together uh, within a mile of, you know, of Higgins. So um, I, I understand the issues and, you know, concerns and the need to do, to take some measures potentially. Um, but I'm, I don't have a solution for it. I, I'm, but I'm, you know, I'm sympathetic and open-minded about it. But I don't know what people are saying. Tom, you wanted to weigh in? Yeah, I mean, this was certainly discussed at the time this uh, ordinance was put in place in response to the state law being created. Um, I think it does get a little tricky in terms of the mechanism as to where you allow them, where you don't. I know prior considerations had to do with lot size. Uh, you might be able to designate it by zoning district. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the problem I think that presents is really educating the public. You know, so we start to slice and dice this, allow it here and there. Right. Um, so I, I just mentioned as a kind of a cautionary note, um, as as simple as we can come up with a mechanism right. is the way to go. Right. Uh, the more complicated, the more difficult it will be to educate the public, frankly. Okay. Um, I'm going to weigh in. I've never been in favor of the fireworks in town, and I just soon see them banned throughout town. Um, but that's been me since day one. Uh, and I know we've get pushback on that. Um, but again, I think it, what I would like to do and Liam, don't go too far here. He's rolling around is I know we've Liam, do you mind doing a little bit of research just to see where our neighboring towns are at now? Cause I know some of them allowed it and then they banned it and some have put in more whatever. And I would just like to, some feedback on that. I know um, Allison gave us some pretty specific thoughts like the 300 foot distance. And I would encourage anyone to, if you could give us some, some very specific things in email, I would, I would suggest that we look at those and come back early next year, um, you know, sometime in the first quarter and see if we can take a stab at what makes sense and what's going on with our neighbors. Does that make sense to folks? Ken and Dawn? I'm getting shaking heads. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm in, in favor of that. Okay. So what we'll do is we're going to, could I have a motion to table this until, and I'm not gonna say a date certain, I'm gonna say first quarter, is that okay? Tom, can I do that? Can we say first quarter? Um, yeah, there may be a different ordinance committee, but uh, staff will recall yeah, right. that and bring it forward to right. uh, the new leadership. Right. Sure. So I'd like to, uh, uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to that effect that we postpone um, deliberation on, and discussion uh, on the, the consumer fireworks ordinance until uh, Q1 2021. I have a second on that. I second that. And uh, could we have a vote, Mr. Hamill? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. And then Ms. Katarina is a yes. So thank you everybody um, for your, your input and we will um, keep working on that and looking again, I'd like to be updated on what's going on because uh, I haven't seen any updates on fireworks for a couple of years with a uh, local. All right, now next growth ordinance and I see two gentlemen in the audience either of you wish to use your three minutes each to speak raise your hand if you do otherwise it's going to be forever hold your peace no that's not exactly true Rocky Mr. Asperi should be all set okay thank you Hopefully three minutes you Rocky you can hear me no, yes, I, don't, I, I, can. Don't have, I won't take three minutes. I'm, oh, really, okay. I'm, I'm here more to, more to okay. listen. <laughs> All um, right. I think a lot of folks understand, you know, what I think about the effectiveness of the growth management ordinance, uh, what it's done for the town for the last 20 years, uh, which is a big nothing. But uh, I'm here to listen. And uh, Dan Bacon is here um, listening as well. And um, we're here to, to help or answer questions if we can. Uh, I certainly was involved 
uh, day one when the growth uh, management ordinance came into play and uh, be happy to answer some questions. Uh, other than that, I'm just gonna listen. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, with that being said, um, I think what we should do is, I know Jay's prepared a number of uh, handouts. I've got a whole stack of them that I printed out here. Uh, and Jay, if you don't mind kind of going down through the answers to our questions, is that how we should, do you feel this is how we should proceed, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Hamill? Well, there's an awful, awful lot of material here. Thank you very much, Jay. Great work. Hopefully we can put all this together as a packet because 35 years I've been in town, this keeps coming on up. So this could be a readily available, you know, primer, primer for somebody coming, coming in. Uh, and Mr. Rosbera is correct. Our growth management ordinance hasn't done much. So that's why we're having this discussion. So uh, members of the public, or maybe Jay should go through the chronological order of from like the 2006 comp plan to where we are now and how things changed. If, yeah. I know that sounds like a big lift. You don't have to get down into all the detail, Jay, maybe uh, the highlights because the material is available for anybody that wants to drill into the detail. But that's my thought, G. Marie. Yeah, I mean, that's where I was going with it also was I don't need every dirty detail, but just a, a 35,000 foot, you know, overview on where, why we are where we're at at this point. Um, and then we can ask questions. Tom? So as opposed to the specific questions that you've you've raised, you'd rather have a uh, kind of a broader overview of growth management ordinance in Scarborough? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd like both. I'd like an overview for folks to get grounded yeah. because there will okay. be public viewing. And then maybe address the questions, which I don't have right in front of me, I apologize. And then maybe a general question answer on certain artifacts that Jay has brought forward. Does that work for you, Don? Yeah, I'm fine with that. I, I think it would be helpful to top line kind of the key milestones. Yeah. Those are really interesting and important, I think. Yeah. And then we got a ton of data, Jay and, and staff, great work on that. I think up, updating this is gonna help us be thoughtful and uh, fact-based, you know, in the discussion and whatever outcome there may be, you know, from our conversation, so. Yeah, you're, making, want, you're making faces. Yeah, no, I just want to, I'm, I'm, I've been looking at what, what I've been able to provide previously, and I just want to, I don't want to rehash ground if, if that's not what you're expecting, um, but I was actually just looking at um, the PowerPoint that we put together from back in June for the June meeting and went through a bit of the history, um, and so I can sort of run through some of those slides if you'd sort of like to, to do that. I think that might answer some of the question and then we can start to, Ken, your, your initial sort of the overview, is that what you're thinking? Or do you really want me to just, you know, from the hip spitball, you know, growth, <laughs> growth and services report from 2000. And not, you know, I, I just, I, I want to be sure I'm serving what you're looking for here. Yeah, um, well, again, I'm only one member of the committee, but I typically understand things by getting a history of things and, and, and in growth, you know, our ordinance started in, 2000, 2001, was kind of dormant till about 2007, 2008 as a result of a 2006 comp plan. So tying all that together, I think uh, works. And again, just high level, but yeah. you you came to present, Jay, I don't want to, uh, I can always find, you know, get what I need through questions when you're done. I, I, yeah, I, I, think I mean, just, just, I didn't have a presentation prepared. I, oh. I, I received oh, oh, oh. I received the questions okay. last last Monday in an email from Jean Marie. I prepared okay. the memo. I really wasn't sure what your expectations were tonight. But okay. I think some of the questions maybe I'm hearing, I could run through a few of these slides that we went through back in June that might serve as a nice primer for folks. Okay. And then we can pivot off of that. I think I have maybe a half dozen or so slides. Um, so I can share screen, start there, and maybe yeah. that will, will be a place to start. We'll see what happens. Good. If it's not, you tell me to stop and we'll, we'll redirect. Okay. Right. Uh, okay, what screen do I wanna share? 
this one over here. Close that. So I assume at this point you're seeing my my screen that says Scarborough's growth management history. Is that yes. correct? Yeah. All yes. right. Great. Um, so yeah, I think this helps to provide some of that backdrop um, leading up to the growth and services uh, report that was developed um, in, in 2000. So, you know, obviously let's see in the late nineties, early two thousands, we were seeing some 200 housing starts uh, in a, I think that's about right in a given year um, or, or yeah, total of 1200 over that six year period. So there's there a lot of pressure um, occurring at that time. And let's see, there we go, it's moving now. There, on that slide, Jay, if I might interrupt, yeah. and, and, and Jim, I don't know if this works for you in terms of us interjecting along the way, or you want us to hold till he finishes? Um, Jay, what are you most comfortable with? I don't mind either As way. I said, I, I, I did not have a presentation prepared, so let's just have a conversation. Yeah. In, that's go. my estimation, yeah. but I'll serve at your pleasure. So with that, I. You know, the only thing I'd say in this slide is it shows, uh, you know, housing units by year. It doesn't really show the cumulative. I know your box shows it, but it doesn't really show the, you know, the, the year on year impact. So by my math, it was something like 1,743 units built in the past 10 year, years, uh, 2010 to 2020. So I, I don't, you know, anyway, that's just, uh, you, know, edit, you know, editorial. I know it shows kind of the the peak year there, year to year, but uh, so this is this is just the history. This is this is late nineties to uh, two. I, I think we'll get to today's data. I guess that was what the question I had heard was. Let's talk. Yeah. What's the history of the growth management? So right. yeah, I'm not. Uh, yeah, and, and that does have twelve thirty eight total units over a six year period. So I think yeah, back to what you said, Don. It's just earlier time period. Yep. Yeah. Um, so again, if this isn't where we need to go, that's fine. No, no, I think it is. I, this, this I is, think it is too. These are the years that led up, uh, that immediately preceded the original GMO. So I think from a historical perspective, this is what was happening that gave rise. And maybe Jay can just walk us through the last 20 years. Yep. And like I said, this is something I developed back in June. So I'll try to remember what I said with each slide, but <laughs> I'm sure it's all in there. So let's see. So um, again, uh, sort of as part of that process, the town was starting to feel um, uh, you know, burdens in the school uh, facilities. We had acute capacity issues at particularly at the middle school and high school. Um, but then there were other uh, stressors on, on municipal services. Um, and so this all led to the growth and services report of which the growth management ordinance was the out product of, if you will. So if I, re if I have my dates <laughs> correct and I can pour through my file here, I believe the growth and services report was 2000 slash 2001. I can't remember the exact date it was accepted by council. Um, and then growth management ordinance was adopted in 2003 originally. Um, so as I said, so, so this, we talked a little bit about what those pressures were. So the growth management ordinance was put in place um, really to do a, a few things. And there's, you know, stated here on the slide to, to pace the rate of housing construction, um, but to provide for immediate housing needs. So to continue to allow for some level of development, um, to ensure the fairness allocation of building permits, and to plan for the continued residential population growth in Scarborough. And I think the next slide sort of talk about how we do those, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. So again, so we established an annual allocation of 135 growth permits. That's what we still have uh, today. Um, it limits individual developments to 20% of the allocation. That's a standard that we still have today. And I know it was one of the questions we have that I think we'll talk about a little bit later in this meeting. Um, the growth management directs housing to our growth areas, and it does so, Ken, I think you sent an email that, uh, or maybe it was Don, I, I don't quite recall, um, asked the question, um, you know, is it possible for the town to, um, to, to, um, to have a differential rate of, how, of growth it, it, across town? And the state statute does allow for that. Um, it, it basically says you can, 
uh, direct limit the amount of growth in sort of your designated rural areas, which we do by allowing only a maximum of 50 uh, of the annual allocation of, or the 135 in the, in the designated rural areas. And the other, uh, what would that leave? 85 units are directed towards our growth areas. Um, should, should note that all 135 could be allocated in the growth areas. It just says a maximum of 50 in the rural areas for what it's worth. Oops, I think I hit. Um, and then the growth uh, ordinance in, uh, includes our reserve pool. Um, so this is an area that was changed uh, fairly, uh, that was enacted with the 2008 amendments to the ordinance. It used to be prior to 2008 whatever growth permits were um, issued rolled over to the next year. Um, and so in 2008, that's when that rollover provision expired or went away, I should say, by ordinance change. It didn't expire. It was an ordinance change by council and created the reserve pool. Um, and the reserve pool, there's a, a few projects. Basically, it says the reserve pool is created by council but then sort of governed, if you will, by the planning board and the planning board can approve certain projects uh, to be eligible from the reserve pool. And those are projects that are using uh, density incentives such as affordable housing or development transfers. That's sort of preservation of open space in simple terms, providing for affordable housing um, or through contract zones. So I guess that really is more of a council action, but then supported by planning board through their subdivision review that occurs after um, a contract zone. Um, let's see. Well, here I just talked a little bit about the reserve pool. And um, so I, let's see if I missed anything here. Um, no, nope, I don't think so. I think we've talked about those items. Hey, Jay, um, if yeah. we could stop here just for a second. The, as you mentioned, the, the uh, ordinance was changed by council in 2008. Uh, what was the source of that change? Do you know? The source of the change? So yeah, the reasoning for the change, because typically the, you know, the council just doesn't wake up one day and say, well, let's go change an ordinance. It's sourced, it's brought forward by somewhere. I, I was just wondering in some of your other documents, so yep. just to expand on this, uh, this came from the uh, comprehensive plan implementation committee correct correct yep yep so Great. yeah i think you're referring to the memorandum that um accompanied the proposed ordinance yep. changes um dated may 29th 2008 correct it was this was effort by the um, comprehensive plan implementation committee staff through this department um and so that memo sort of lays out what those proposed amendments were at that time. Okay, and I mentioned that for you know historical purposes. If anybody watches this in the future, is watching now again. If they want to trace the history of where we are on your slide, there's some background information that you supplied. So thank you. Okay. Uh, and to put a simpler or finer point on that, the you know that was those were direct uh, uh, recommendations, if you will. Uh, from the comprehensive plan. So it's not as if the implementation committee dreamt them up. Um, it was their way of uh, implementing the various various different policies that were expressed in the comp plan itself. And, and can I? That's correct. And can I put a historical perspective on that 2006 comp plan? Um, you may or may not remember, cause I was in the business at the time, but the real estate market was harder than Hades um, from 2003 to about 2006-ish. And I know a lot of what went into the comp plan in 2006 was driven by what was going on in that real estate market at that time also. So, um, and, and I know, um, so when you look at the 2006 comp plan, some of what they've got is a little more directive as a result of that. And I know Rick Cheney is way more up on, on that than I am, but that he talked somewhat about that at our long range planning meeting uh, the other day, so. Proceed, Jay. All right, let's see. So where does this, uh, 
where this PowerPoint in July, June take us next? Oh, so I think, and this is probably still relevant to, I think, some of the discussion that we're having. Um, there's been questions around the, the reserve pool. If you remember, we just talked about how in 2008, the reserve pool was created. It was created with some, I'm going to say 215 growth permits initially, something of, of that ilk. Um, and for from 2008 up until about the 2000 and I'll say mid 2016, there really wasn't any call for that reserve pool. It stayed steady at 215, if I again am recalling the number. Um, but you know, the market there was a change in the market um, in two, 2016. There's starting to be a lot of conversation and interest in the development of multifamily. Um, and so there was a uh, discussion, and I believe I provided some of that, ma those materials to you as well. I'm trying to flip through what I, what I sent. Anyway, there was um, discussion with town council, again, uh, through um, the long range planning committee and a workshop, that's what it was. It was the workshop in December, which I think I had forwarded maybe in an email, um, maybe wasn't in your agenda packet. That's why I'm sort of getting confused of what was sent to you um, uh, about um, sort of the interest that was being seen by the community and um, that the interest in multifamily um, wouldn't be served by the reserve pool that was at, there at the time and sort of there was a walkthrough of what projects were coming. If you recall, the beacon was certainly on the radar at the time, I believe. Um, Actually, I, I'm not sure if the Downs was on the radar at that time to be, um, there was another project in Eastern, mm. I'm sorry, Enterprise Business Park that was being talked about that has subsequently gone away and gone quiet. So we don't know if that, you know, at this point, I would say that that, that one has gone. Um, but there was a couple other multifamily developments that were interested. And so there was a discussion about um, increasing the reserve pool from 215 to 500. Uh, uh, growth permits, which would accommodate the multi the expectation for the multifamily. Um, part of that discussion, as you see here in sort of the second line, is that you know had the reserve pool or had the yeah, um, growth permits continued to roll over from to that you know throughout time, there would have been over 700 permits available. Um, I think that was just part of the the conversation that was uh, in that discussion. Um, and so as part of that conversation, council uh, uh, doesn't look my, uh, council did see fit to ultimately adopt or approve the addition of 500, uh, sorry, 285 to bring the reserve pool up to 500 growth permits. Um, I see my next slide here, which is now dated. Um, so I'm going to skip it. it. It talks, well, I'll just show it to you. I have a, actually and the information that is in your packet. And are you seeing me, are you seeing a yeah. reserve pool allocation? Excellent, yeah. great. That, that's up to date. That's as of uh, October 15, I think, 2020, and nothing's changed in the last five or seven days on the reserve pool. So essentially we have of those 500 permits, um, all but 1,100, 1,100, uh, 111 and a half have either been, um, uh, issued or are, are accounted for either through a contract zone, that's the Piper Shores uh, phase two, or for projects that the planning board has approved as affordable housing and therefore eligible for the reserve pool, which is the Uplands and uh, Jocelyn Place, which I think um, folks are familiar with, but if not, we can talk about that as well. Jay, if, if we could stop there for a second. Sure. If you don't mind. Do we typically reserve permits? So what I would, I guess the way I would frame these is right now, these are projects and maybe reserved isn't exactly the right word. These are projects that are eligible for the reserve pool. Okay. If another, if let's say for some reason, pick any one of them, I'll say the Uplands, right? Okay. Just for some reason, if the Uplands doesn't move forward and then let's say, four or five other projects come come along, get approved and and come and ask for the reserve pool permits before that project. 
then it would um, sort of this isn't these these aren't held in place, if you okay. will, in line. It's when they actually come ask for the permits. I will mention that for you know Jocelyn Place and the Uplands, those are examples of projects that are eligible for um, for the reserve pool through affordable housing. Right. And if you might remember, and I think we talked about this in the ordinance, or certainly in the ordinance, and maybe in one of the memos, um, the reserve pool is filled by town council. That, that's, how, that's how the reserve pool gets more permits in it. However, uh, it's so, and then it's drawn down by the allocation of those permits. What the ordinance says is if at the end of a calendar year that the reserve pool is down, you know, is drawn all the way down, automatically there's 20 permits put back in the reserve pool and those 20 permits are set aside specifically for affordable housing. Yep. So, so though the reserve pool is wholly controlled by council, there's always going to be 20, at least as written, there's always going to be 20 in that reserve pool in any given year, no matter what happens. Okay. Let me, let me just follow up on this. So your top, when you, when you're giving us the uh, used or accounted for with, with the remaining, yep. the below numbers, are they reflected in those top numbers? Uh, I believe if we take five sixty-seven and a half plus fifty-two plus thirty-nine plus thirty, we should get to three eighty-eight and a half. Okay. So again, just for discussion. I'm a planner, so don't don't test my math too closely. Please. I'm not. You, you <laughs> much better than I could. So just just for understanding, yep. I, and I know you're being optimistic here. Uh, it it does get a little confusing, especially for the folks that. Don't haven't been reading about this for for months. That these are permits and not necessarily not, not units. Okay, so your Jocelyn Place is thirty permits, correct? But sixty units. Uplands is thirty nine permits, but seventy eight units. Okay, that's just to clarify. Yep. So I actually have so, a slide that helps. Yeah. No, I can understand. Let me. Oh, I'm going to lose my train of thought. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> So really from a snapshot perspective, number one, we don't know that Jocelyn Place is gonna move forward because we understand that's a very, it's a, it's a process. We were just part of that process, right? So they could go away. And my understanding, Mr. Rosberg can correct me when time allows, is that the first phase of the uplands is, is gonna be going on. That was bonded. Uh, through through the people's vote and released by our current governor, that's seventy eight in total, but they're only coming forward with I think thirty nine units initially. So, just again observation. So, the numbers look good. I just not, I can't reconcile them in my head, but maybe we can uh, offline that or something. You you know what I mean, Don? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, I follow your, yeah, where you're. Yeah, you know. because theoretically, there's many more than 111 left. Right? Yeah, I mean, I, this, so this whole discussion for me, I mean, I to kind of build just for a moment on Ken, I don't want to get you off your train of thought, but, you know, we talked about what is the purpose of the growth management ordinance, and you had several points there. One was to make sure that we're, you know, we're addressing the mix properly, but the, it seems that the driving force there was uh, to make sure there were enough permits to accommodate demand and development. And that that oh. would not really from the council, but from the developers and actually the suggestions on the measures that were made and actually voted on by the council didn't come from the council. They came from, from the planning staff and, and up that way. Right. So, you know, I, because we're by no means, I mean, I think Ken is probably closest to being an authority on growth management at the moment, but by no means do I think that the council, you know, individually or, or, or collectively as a body are experts on development. I mean, we are, sure. you know, we are, we're citizen representatives. We, you know, we, we're kind of trying to use our best judgment with the help of staff. So I just, but it does seem to me, I'm, I'm kind of curious going back to, and I'm hopping around here a little bit, so forgive me, but, you know, Rocky, Rocky's point, I'd like to learn more from him about, if from my calculus here, from my simple math, it seems that the growth management ordinance has more than provide, more than accommodated 
so a couple of the objectives. We've driven development toward um, you know growth areas and toward mixed you know mixed uh, mixed uh, you know not two not acre you know family home you know, three or four bedroom homes on two acres. They've been you know in growth areas, and that there've been there've been enough of them, then enough of the permits in order to accommodate the demand for you know for housing. So, but it does, but when somebody says that the GMO has not done much, it does seem to me it's more than delivered in terms of what the developers needed and what was underlying that. So, um, Dawn, did you have a question that you wanted Rocky to Rick, pop question, in on? You help me understand why you don't think it's done anything, the GMO. While he's coming in, can I just make one distinction? I don't want to belabor the point, but I would take some exception, uh, I would say that the Piper Shores phase two are reserved. That was done through the contract zone process. Yes. We yeah. have guaranteed that those will be available. So yeah. uh, we, we definitely need to yeah. reserve those to the side. Yeah. And actually I'll have to check, those permits may have been issued actually within the last week. I know I yeah. just saw a big, big bundle of <laughs> site plans for that next phase of Piper Shores. So if they haven't been issued yet, they are right on the cusp. So sorry for the big windup. Is Rocky can Rocky weigh in? Uh, point on I think I assume you folks can hear me. I yeah. think yes. I unmuted myself. Um, so the reason I say that that you know the growth management ordinance hasn't done much or hasn't really done anything is that if you look at the twenty odd years that it's been in place and you add up all the numbers of what actually got built, it averages you know not too far off from about one hundred and thirty five units a oh, year. Right. Right. So that's that's my point of it hasn't done a whole lot. I think really what's done a whole lot for this town is the, the amended zoning that went in place um, as part of the uh, 2006 comp plan, where okay. it, it focused our attention more on, I mean, we were doing nothing but building three and four bedroom colonials, one after another, and all my family's done it for 50 years. Yeah. Um, and, and what the zoning, the changes in the zoning have, have allowed us to focus on more multifamily, more affordable, more different types of units. I don't feel like the, and, and you know, Dan could jump in and correct me if he thinks I'm wrong, but I don't feel like the growth management ordinance really has done anything to help that. I think it's been tweaked over the last few years to allow it to continue to occur. Um, what One thing that the town, you know, what a lot of people realized is that you know, as you're building these multifamily buildings, well, you know, there are instances where you can't buy enough growth permits to actually build the whole building in one year. And so we're, we're facing that with the downs. I mean, that, that, that issue's coming. Uh, that, you know, the, we've got buildings that, that everybody is gonna want to see built and we can't buy enough permits to, to build them in a year. So, but I don't think that the growth management ordinance has helped in any way. I think it's been the, the zoning changes that have helped. Uh, to get the diverse mix of housing types. Thanks, Rocky. Thanks. That's really helpful. Appreciate that explanation. I, I'm, I'm just wondering if this, is this sort of the, the slide that we're talking about in terms of, this at least shows the last 10 years or um, from hmm. you know, 2010 to 19 um, averages. And so what you can really see is this block right there, um, the 10 year average has been 131. Um, and I think if you go to years, if you were to do a 10 year segment, certainly, you know, that starts, uh, you know, that doesn't include the big, the big recent boom from 17, 18 and 19, that number would have been much lower. Um, and I think that's sort of what Rocky is referring to is that um, ostensibly We've been hitting that. That, that is my point, Jay. That, that's yeah. my point. It, let me follow up on that, if you don't mind, Jay. I mean, this isn't the forum to, you know, take a position on everything, but it, it, it's, I, I think there's a disconnect in, in understanding what the growth management intent was. It was to manage the pace of growth, okay? And the original intent was 135 homes. We, we call them now units because we fractionalize them. You know, and I've said it before, after a hard day's work, I don't go to my unit, I go to my home. And that's whether it's an apartment, a condo, a manufactured home, or a little ranch where I'm at. So I think some folks are just missing the point. 
I don't look at the 10 year average. I look at the last five years. And I look what's in the pipeline right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we'll end the discussion with there because it, it could, could rapidly go downhill. But it's important, I think, for some folks that are going to be in this discussion to understand it's the pace of growth. And all you got to look at is 19 from 15 on and look at current year and what's in the pipeline. And this town, no town could sustain that rate or pace of growth. So continue, Jay. Thank you very much. <laughs> I had, a, I had a quick follow up, if I could. Sorry to interrupt, Jay, Madam Chair, if I might just follow up on Ken's point there. Yeah, go ahead. If we're just looking at, you know, units or dwellings or permits, you know, the thing that's striking to me is so I look at those numbers, they seem really big. I mean, you know, I think that figure that I used before, you know, 1,750 or so units in the past, past uh, 10 years. But has our population grown by 2,000 people, Tom, in that time? I mean, what, what, what am I missing there on that? Um, uh, quite, quite, quite likely, we don't have uh, very good data. Of course, we're just uh, closing the decennial census as we speak, so we'll know much more. What I can say, uh, a barometer of that would be voter registration, and I yeah. presume the majority of that would be from new residents, not entirely. Uh, but we have seen certainly a flurry uh, of voter registration. So uh, my, my senses were 21,000 people at this point. So I think uh, it's fair to say that there has been a commensurate increase in uh, population growth, yes. So I just ask that we kind of keep that in mind as we're moving forward and really trying to get our arms around the impact of development. I think that's a, a, a lot of why we're digging into data, data and asking so many questions is for us to really you know, help, uh, help everyone understand, help the, the public uh, and the players who are close to it validate you know, what, what is the impact been. So I just, you know, I asked that we keep that in mind. Thanks, Jay. Thanks. Yeah, I yeah, just wanted to, this is some information we had, at least just shows sort of percentage, but obviously behind that percentage are numbers. So we can try to pull that out. And maybe what I'm hearing, the, the question um, or the, the, the interest, sorry for my quick scrolling here, is to sort of see maybe the town's population sort of underlaid or embedded with this, um, because what we're looking at now is the growth permits and units. Um, is that is that sort of the interest that I'm hearing? Because I, I think that's a fairly um, something we could pull pull together. Um, so I think it's going to look a little skewed. There'll be at least probably a, a one or two year a lag, lag. But um, I think you could see the pattern. You know, yep. Yeah, I mean certainly that that's part of the problem with you know uh, uh, demographic data. It always lags. Um, but you know with the U.S. Census coming out, it's going to take them. You know usually. I think we usually see that data six to eight months sort of into the next calendar year. So probably around this time next year, we should have even better numbers, but certainly we can help to articulate the conversation for now with the best we have. And I, I also want to interject that um, you're not only getting population growth from new housing or new housing opportunities. I mean, there are people moving into town you know, we've got an aging population. They're selling their houses and they, they lived in these houses that and they had four kids in them and now there's two of them and now they're leaving. And so you got people in and out. So, I mean, so to me, the whole, I don't know. Yeah, that might not work. Is, yeah. is, you know, I don't think it's healthy to put up a gate at the end of Scarborough and saying we aren't going to have any more growth. And to me, the growth management ordinance is, uh, helps us to so-called uh, control that uh, in, in many respects. And if you look at what we've put in for so-called growth, uh, we aren't necessarily negatively impacting schools. And that's why I wanted the, that data brought forward. Uh, Piper Shores is that they're going to be taking care of their own you know, plowing and public works and whatever. They don't have kids in schools. Um, so there's, you know, there's upside downside to everything. And then from a purely real estate point of view, the more you limit housing and housing options, the more expensive it becomes um, for folks. So is that what we want to be as a town? That's just the question that I'm throwing out there as a rhetorical question. You know, where do we want to be? Do we want to be too expensive for anybody to live in? 
I don't want to see that happen. So keep that in mind also. I just, I don't want to lose sight of, uh, of the fundamental uh, point here. We started with it and I think Rocky spoke to it as well, but this uh, seminal report, this growth in services, what they did was it for the first time kind of quantified what people expected or were seeing is that uh, single family home in particular, but it went into much more detail. It talked about different housing types in terms of impact. And so the, the initial impetus for this, and from my perspective, it still is the central point, the type of development uh, matters. And what matters here is what impact on municipal services. So that's a, that's a big part that gets wrapped up into this discussion and, and gets lost. And that's where the fractionalization piece came in is uh, appreciating that not all residential housing types have the same impact. Right. Yeah. Let me just follow up on that, Tom, if you don't mind. I, I think everybody agrees with that. Don't we, you know, I think decouple your perceptions of why people are challenging the growth. Nobody doesn't want any growth. But the confusing part is, again, how we've done it with the fractionalizations. We, we've moved from managing growth to promoting growth. If you would like, I will read you the definition of the two, because there's a clear distinction. We're market driven. We're not managing growth. Market driven, you can see it, it permeates through all these documents, all the all the uh, meetings I've, I've watched. Uh, it's, it's kind of like there's something coming and we don't have enough to do it. So we've got to change something to get it. The interesting part is you go back to the 2006 comp plan, which an awful lot of this stuff came out of. This started with net residential that got turned into permit fractionalization. Clearly stated in the 2006 comp plan, which not, is not even referenced in the 2020 plan. That's why that thing is going gonna, gonna to have some discussion. Is the vision of population growth. 10 to 12 times there's strategies and actions in the 2006 that is contrary to what we're doing. Let me just give you one example. Maintain a cap on the number of new dwelling units that can be built in any year until the town's municipality and school facilities can adequately service those increases. Let's take a walk down eight corners. How many modules there? Pleasant Hill, on and on, and with the traffic. So this is throughout the 2006. The 135 initial set of the permits made sense. The fractionalization just blew that, that model to bits. And again, I, I'm not against any type of growth. I'm all for growth that is less cost to serve. It gets back to the pace of the growth. And I'll end on that one. I won't even interject if somebody else brings something up. But I'll tell you, that, that, is, that is definitely my feelings, and I am only one counselor but I don't think I'm alone there. It's the pace. Ken, if, if I respond, are you gonna just- I'll, I'll stay on mute. No, fair enough. No, no, I, I, I appreciate you citing that part of uh, that section of the 06 plan and, and you're right. Uh, I, I don't think we've met that in fact, uh, but keep in mind uh, multifamily, and you know, increased density and, and uh, fractionalization, all were designed to advance other very clear priorities and themes in that same plan. Housing choice, housing diversity, uh, increased density. So uh, yes, you can look and, and point to things that weren't accomplished, but by the same token, um, the, the sorts of decisions that had been made were done to advance the very vision and priorities um, elaborated in that plan. So. Yeah. All life's a balance, Tom. All life's a balance. Oops, did I come off mute? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do. I just want to make mention, and I, Tom, just to echo what you said, and I, I understand, you know, this is where a comprehensive plan, where it, 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 it paints, it tries to put the whole in town under one umbrella of a plan where obviously, you know, there's so many complex pieces that 
really, I think we tried to focus this updated comprehensive plan, the 2020 comprehensive plan, when we started talking about it as a more visionary document. Because when you look at the 2006 comprehensive plan, it does have, as you just totally spelled out, you know, the, action, the, the items about cap and growth, but it also talks very explicitly about doing density based on number of bedrooms. So it, it has these, you know, can be viewed as conflicting items or others could view them as <laughs> symbiotic items. It really is a matter of perspective and interest. Um, and so I think that's where, again, we've talked about, and I don't wanna take us down this other path of the 2020 comp plan, but really the 2020 comp plan is trying to be much, is being much more visionary and less um, prescriptive and really that it leaves these type of discussions to the next level, uh, the, the, the following work, um, that there's certainly more to be done, but. All right, so where were we? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, as I said, I, I guess I, I didn't really have a presentation coming into tonight. I know you guys had, you know, I received that yeah, yeah, email no, from that's Eugene okay. Marie, so I'm, yeah. uh, I guess if there aren't questions or you're not feeling, you know, well, maybe. Well, uh, well let me let me just yeah. say this, that I, from what I'm gleaning from my discussions with my fellow counselors, offline, here, whatever, um, is a concern. And Ken, correct me if I'm wrong, okay, if I'm not hearing you right. But it, it, the big, con and Dawn also, is fractionalization keeps coming up as, as to um, an issue. And my guess, my best guess is that because we, we say, oh, 135 permits, let's say, but actually those permits could be double that because of fractionalization, i.e. it actually is double the number of family units or whatever you want to call them uh, going in there. Am I correct on that assumption? So that gets people concerned and leads, lends to the feeling that development is, is too much development, is too fast, and that we're um, I forget, how do you say it, Dawn? We're skiing over the tips of our skis or whatever it is that <laughs> Dawn says all the time. Yeah, over the tips. Yes. yeah, that we're over the tips of our skis sometimes. That there's that perception. Now, I know for myself, I don't necessarily see it or feel it the same way, but I'm in the business. So I'm see you know, I know what's going on all the time with, with building and what people are looking for and whatever. So we need to educate people on where we're at um, and what we mean by those terms. And then we have to go back to the council at some point, point. this is why this is the beginning of it, to say, is there anything that needs to be fixed in the, comp, in the uh, excuse me, in the growth management ordinance um, or tweaked or is it fine? And again, I'm, and then I'm going to go back, and I'm sorry, I'm talking off the top of my head here. is always a dangerous thing. But we've got to get the comprehensive plan out there because according to state statute, you really need to have the overall art, overarching picture of the comp plan before you really need, can go in and, and make uh, substantive, let's use that legal term, I'm not a lawyer, but substantive changes to a growth management ordinance. Uh, Ken, you had your hand up, and then Dawn. Yeah, just a side note. We're right now we're operating under the 2006 plan until we right. modify 2020. That might That's be a while. So I want to. I'd like to use this time just to again ask some questions, if I may. Jay and Rocky could probably chime in. I, uh, I do believe the chairs reached out to m and and asked them if they could bring forward a uh, probably a five-year plan on what they think they'll be building out on a residential side. That will help us. Uh, we're going to welcome that. I've asked Mr. O'Meary, O'Leary, you know who I mean, Cottage is <laughs> on Sawyer to do the same thing. I was going to go uh, talk to KD and, uh, and Elliot also. So... Uh, Back to the permits. I know we see things in the pipeline, and uh, but a, a 
permit, regardless if it's fractionalized, whatever. Somebody gets a permit, it's traded in for a building permit, right? And that's how you reconcile the pools against what's being used or whatnot. What is typically though the turnaround time from allocating or, or reserving, for lack of a better term, a pool of permits before they're all used? The reason why I'm mentioning that is, uh, is it O'Leary? Mark O'Leary, yep. Yeah, On thank cottages, you. Cottages at Sawyer, correct. Yeah, for cottage, right. He told me his plan, because I asked him what his plan was and told him that we were gonna be inviting him in for a discussion and he's more than willing to come in and uh, speak with us. But off the cuff, not to hold him to anything, he thought it, it, he was about a three year project. He'd be banging out probably 30, 35 units in a year. Okay, so his project's allocated roughly 92, but that doesn't mean 92 units homes are going to be built in a year, correct? So what is usually the typical turnaround? I mean, I know, I would, I would think uh, if Jocelyn Place comes to play, you know, that, that's going to be a fairly significant uh, enterprise there. That would probably be about a two year project also, right? Before, you know, breaking ground and moving in, I would think probably two years. So we should think of those things too. Not, it's not only necessarily a number, but how are they distributed and when are they really used? So, because that gets back to pace, right? Well, keep in mind that multifamily was a game changer. Uh, Beacon, you know, they've got 12 units under one roof. And so yeah. when they're coming in, they are getting a, a 12 growth permits because uh, just practically speaking, and, and the pace of that construction is unparalleled. Whereas a hundred lot subdivision, look okay. at Eastern Village and Dunstan Crossing, they're still going. over 10 years. Yep. So um, it's just unprecedented uh, in terms of the, 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 the pace of, of the development. They're able to build them out so much faster. I'll be shocked if O'Leary can produce 35 single family in a year. There's just practical challenges in doing so. But, but they uh, are modular. So that's different. They're going to yep. come in pre-made. So Fair enough. Fair enough. But you're right. Your point is extremely well taken. There'll be a, a number of years before the full yeah. requirement hits us. Which, which is important to understand because, you know, again, if the public looked at our charts and we see all this pipeline, you go, oh, my goodness. And granted, it's a reality. You can't change it. But that's not all going to come for 2021. You know, it, it, it will probably roll out to 24, even 25. So, uh, you know, again, we're just seeking under understanding there's, there's been no decision made, there's been no council discussion. Don, you've had your hand patiently raised. Thank you, thanks. I, you know, uh, I think uh, Ken's comments are, are very valid. Uh, it highlights for me the fact that, uh, you know, we, we have a hard time using uh, common terminology and, 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 and that way having common understanding for what the, what the pace has been, what the impact has been. Um, and I don't want to leave that point entirely, but I did, I, I, you know, one thing I wanted to point out though, is that the, the statements uh, referencing growth are pretty important uh, from the comprehensive plans. And I know the one from 2006 really went somewhere along the lines of promoting, promoting development and a different type of development. But, but prior to that, I think that the statement, the lead statement we had on growth from the comprehensive plan was, um, to use the growth management ordinance to um, help us manage growth. Okay, so somewhere along the way, we you know we made a strategic decision. We stepped on the accelerator. We said we need more uh, and different types of housing. So that's that's kind of my going back to the Jay's comment about um, uh, the fact that the you know the the update um, is. Um, intended to be more strategic and higher level, it, we still, I think, need to be very careful about uh, what sort of statement we validate as it relates to growth and development. So, so anyway, Jay, you can maybe help me with the exact wording of the earliest comprehensive plan before the, you know, the 2006 plan. But right. uh, seem to recall there was a there was a shift there, and I have the exact wording, but I'm I'm, I'm not I'm not sure I'm going to be able pull that out of total recall. Uh, I think the plan before the 06 plan, if I remember right, there was a, uh, I want to say 99 plan. I think there was a 93 plan. I could be off on the 99. I, I, 
but um, the quote, but I saw one the other day where someone actually, you know, did some archaeology and pulled out the one, you know, prior to 2006. And it was it was definitely a, a more more balanced, nuanced commitment around growth and development than than the one that we approved and been following. And so I would just say we should make sure that we have an open discussion about that and say, do we continue the pace that we're growing at? And we have a full understanding of what's happened in the past five or 10 years, you know, or, or you know, do we or, or not? So. Right. I'm gonna um, jump in I since did hear, Katarina is not calling on me. What, what, what? I didn't look over that side yet. Oh, oh You've been, know, you've been hogging, to, go ahead. <laughs> no, it's, it, you know, I think we can all agree we may have difference of opinions on, on growth in general, because it's a big topic. There's a lot to grow, yeah. right? Uh, but we, we have, like Don said, we have definitely moved from managing our growth to promoting our growth. And there is definitely a difference. Anybody want me to read the definitions? I'll give you a, a, a side thing. I had a long discussion with a Wyndham Town Councilor that just implemented their GMO in August of 2028. And I asked him right up front, I said, would you go to MMA and pull out the boilerplate? Because, you know, MMA has got a bunch of boilerplate ordinances for us to start so that we don't have to start from scratch. And he goes, we were going to do that, but we actually used Scarborough's That's right. growth management. He said, because we liked what the way you guys were addressing affordable housing. Yep. He says, but we quickly determined that you were promoting growth and not managing growth. And we deviated, devi we pulled out about what we could and we deviated away from it. Now, that was an unsolicited outside thing. And, and there definitely is a difference. I hope people understand there's a difference. That's not managing. That's It's promoting. It's what we're doing. But, it's the fractionalization that's made things even confusing. I mean, I sat in on two long range planning committees where the members, very bright members, were struggling with this fractionalization, which was a little curious because two members of LRPC were on the CPIC that defined a fractionalization, but that's a story for a different day. So if anything, we should also make this a little bit more understandable, not only for future counselors, because remember, we rotate all, all the time. I've spent 100 hours on this, digging, drilling, and then Magic Man here, Jay brings up all this stuff, which was great. It confirmed what my understanding was, but nothing should be that, that difficult to understand. Nothing we didn't even get into the transferring, right? The transferring alone will, will make your head spin. So can I ask a question at this point? Because we've been at this now for an hour. Um, where do we want to go today? Because we're not going to solve growth right. issues today. No. Um, I do have another meeting at 6. So I have to, you know, I can't go on all night here either. Um, I'll but, make a suggestion. Yeah. Uh, and Jay's got his hand up too. Because right. every, you know, everybody is, everybody needs to be heard. And I mean that sincerely. Not yep. lip service. So we've extended the invite to m &R. I think we should next then do an, ex, uh, an invite to the other developers and maybe have a, just a, a workshop, bring yep. forward maybe some questions that we would like them to answer from their perspective. Okay. Maybe their three or five year plan, things like that. Maybe their past experiences with, obtaining uh, growth permits, things like that. We also need to hear from the school, even though we did have a great, I did see a chart, Jay, it's still stuck back in December of uh, 2020, no, 19. But we do need to have a discussion with the school because we did have a great workshop back in December, if you remember, that was migrations, new birth and new development. I'd like to be able to isolate that. They must have the data to be able to isolate that to just uh, new growth very well may not even be an issue for the schools, the new growth. It's probably migration that's more of an impact. We can't do anything about migration. Can't do anything about new births. Thank God, right? So that's what I would suggest. You said next steps. I think mm -hmm. we should have two 
meetings, workshops, whatever you call with those other two groups. And then maybe as a committee formulate uh, some recommendations to the council, like what we were charged with. Okay. Then open it up for the public process. All right, Jay, you had your hand up. Sure. Um, yeah, I think you know this this issue of fractionalization is, if you recall, again back through the summer, I think you know pivoting off that June workshop that we had, um, the ordinance committee asked the long range planning committee. You had four or five questions. That's that August seventh memo I think I provided you, um, and I feel you know the long range planning committee worked through that and I think gave recommendations, fairly solid recommendations you know, at least from their perspective, you know, on four out of the five. And I think fractionalization was the one that very clearly mm -hmm. required additional work to be done. And so that is, I'm currently working on developing that additional staff. We just recently, Ken, to your point, um, I think it was this week, received the um, uh, school enrollment the entire school enrollment. So, so you'll recall that presentation was just focused on that kindergarten class. And we've long been saying, boy, we'd love to do this for the entire population. We now have the entire 2,874 student population. So we're gonna be able to do a slide similar to what we've done before as to where, where, where's that pressure coming from? Um, what we saw, if you recall from the kindergarten class is really the pressure is coming from the those single family homes right. that were built in the 70s, 80s and 90s. Is that true through the whole population? We don't, we, so that's part of what we're working on. We wanna work on ground truthing. If you remember, we've talked a bit about, there were some assumptions made going into that 2017 decision by council to increase the reserve pool. We wanna ground truth those. So um, staff will be working through, really I, I see through the rest of this calendar year, to pull that data together. So we're ready to have that conversation, um, you know, in full with, with, with you all. So um, I guess that was your question sort of, uh, you know, um, I did, and, and maybe we can answer it offline. You did ask a question about how do growth permits get turned into a building permit and what's that look like? I can answer that now, or I can do that offline with you. Um, I know that was some time ago and maybe we've moved on from that question, but I did jot it down, so. Um, we, yeah, I mean, essentially, by and large, what we see is most, most growth permits come in right with a building permit. They, they, they come in and it's seamless. Occasionally, what we see, particularly for the, the larger projects, um, folks w might come in and, and um, in, particularly if it's a larger project, because you can buy upwards of, what was it, 27 in one calendar year? So they might, you know, buy 20 in... December of uh, 2020, right. and then come get another 20 in January of 2021, and now you have 40. Now right. you convert that into one 40-unit building permit. Yeah. That's what we sometimes see. I will say that the growth management ordinance says a growth permit is good for six months. Yeah. So occasionally, very rarely, do we see them expire. Um, it, very rarely. Um, but that's how, that, so that is how long one could last for. But to your question, what do we typically see? We typically see it fairly seamless. Um, frankly, administratively, it's a, it's a bit of a pain when someone comes and buys a growth permit and doesn't assign it to a building permit. But um, our, our administrative staff is uh, very adept at, at tracking all that. And, um, but. Okay, um, I see that Rocky has his hand up. But Rocky, before you talk, Dawn, how are you doing with where we're going right now? I'm fine with what we've, uh, you know, what has been said and what the direction seems to be. Uh, just a, a reminder that if we roll back and we go back to the questions that we started asking as a committee, the long range planning committee um, in June and over the summer, uh, you know, that was motivated because the, we felt the temperature rising on the topic of growth and development. Since, since then, we put it into a timeline. We're going to make sure we're tracking with the update of the comprehensive plan and, and other data that Jay's been good enough to gather. I like what Ken had to say about, you know, having other meetings with other developers right. and getting input from the board of that. But I think at some point we need to try to, you know, I think there's, there, someone had mentioned the possibility of a workshop with the long range planners, perhaps a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting of some sort or hybrid 
where where we could try to draw this all down into something that will have to then have a flight path and a timing. So I don't know what it is yet, but mm -hmm. I think we we're taking the time to make sure we're following a process that hopefully will help us, you know, validate what's happened and verify what we you know feel we need to do next, if anything, around mm -hmm. uh, around statements. You know. One of the things I'm hearing pretty clearly, I think, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, is we need to workshop with developers. And I'd like, if we're gonna do that, I'd like to get as many developers in town as possible. I mean, there's a number of them out there. I mean, they're the usual suspects, so to speak, but if we get others also would be good. Um, am I here, do you think that's correct, Ken and Dawn? Yeah, uh, Jay's brought up, I think, four who are, who are basically the players in town. Everybody else does like one-offs, the guy like built my house, Ray Levante did about yeah, but Ray does a lot of building. Well, he does now. He didn't. He didn't back in the day. So, uh, um, yeah, I'd just like to get something wrapped up before uh, November third yeah. because this could be a, a totally different world uh, a month from today. You well, know, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa! You want to wrap up what? What? No, no. Oh, thank uh, God. I'd okay. like to document out bullet bullet point the next steps. So, yeah. if we do transfer this to some other yeah. group then it, there's a clear direction. Right. They don't have to start. And again, that packet that Jay just right. made, absolutely right. great. I'm going to, I'm going to leave the town with that. Okay. So let me, can does. I go to Rocky before I forget? Yep. And before we get too far off, Liam, can you? Thank you. Thank you, Jean Marie. I've had yeah. my hand up just for the record for the last 45 minutes. I'm sorry. Uh, but I appreciate you recognizing me. <laughs> Um, and I got a bunch of things, but I'm not going to address those. What I wanted to say was, was just a couple of things. I think what, what, what the committee should be thinking about is 135 units was chosen for a reason when it was chosen. And that has carried forward. I mean, the math shows it. That's basically what we've averaged is around 135 for the last 20 odd years. So that math was, was arrived at for a reason. Uh, and, and so, and that made sense at the time. In 2006, what happened is, and, and I would invite people to go, Mark Ironman wrote a very, uh, very detailed memo uh, in November of 2006. But what happened in 2006 is, is many people recognized that, hey, the only thing getting built in the town of Scarborough is four bedroom right. colonials. Right. And they're killing us with right. four bedroom colonials. No one's building anything but four bedroom colonials. So let's tweak our zoning. Let's change things to try to encourage some different kinds of housing types to be built. Um, and, and so the zoning was changed. The growth management ordinance had to change with the zoning ordinance. I mean, how do you have a zoning ordinance that says one thing and a growth management ordinance that says another? You can't have that. They gotta, they gotta go hand in glove. So the focus was to try to get developers to build units that were uh, a better ROI model for the town of Scabro. Right. Uh, and in fact, that's what, what has happened. It, very simply put, you know, we could, we could go out and, and get growth permits. Uh, and, you know, we could build uh, 100 single family, four bedroom houses, or we could build 200 one bedrooms. Well, the ROI model for the town, hands down, 200 one bedrooms is way better. Mm -hmm. So that's why the fractionalization is important. If, if we go back to, you know, a unit is a unit, we're going to head for the things that sell for the most money. I mean, yeah. we're, we're going to build four bedroom colonials. That's all there is to it. It just, if the town wants to direct that growth and try to get growth that gives a positive ROI to the town, you have to have the fractionalization. Um, I have never thought that we needed the growth management ordinance that the market itself would, would carry. And, you know, you had years where we built a whole lot of units and we had years where we did not build many at all. And the proof is in the pudding. If you look at the last 20 years, it averages around 135. So, you know, the fractionalization to me is, is important. Um, I know it's confusing to some people, but it's really not that tough. Uh, and it's directing, it's trying to direct growth into units that is a better ROI model for the town of Scarborough. And, and the numbers have, have proved out. And, you know, I think we gave the town a pretty good uh, presentation the other night. Uh, Jim DeMisa spent a lot of time on that. And, 
and I would invite uh, you know questions on that. Uh, but I think the the proof is in the pudding that the you know those one bedroom, one and two bedroom multifamily units are a whole lot better uh, than than uh, you know four bedroom colonials for the town. Mm -hmm. um, I had other things to cover, but I've forgotten them by now. I know Dan had his hand up too, and I don't know if you have time to let him in, but uh, I'm going to stop. Okay, thank you, Rocky. Dan, if you do, you have something quick to say. Dan, guess he doesn't have his hand up. All right, Ken. Yeah. Uh, 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 my, my parting comments is I, I, I hear the developer. I understand it from the developer's perspective. I, again, don't like bail threats about we do this, you're going to do that. Uh, town does have every right to manage the pace of growth in its town. And uh, uh, this, this council, I think, is uh, reviewing it's that. Not, I apologize if you think that was a threat. It, well, it guys. What I'm trying to say is that if the town directs us in that direction, that's where they're going to go. Developers always want to follow the rules. They never want to not follow the rules. They want the easiest path to the end. Yep. So if that's what the, the zoning ordinance always directed us towards single family homes, the growth management ordinance originally directed us towards single family homes. It didn't direct yep. us towards multifamily. Right. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have butted in. But I, I did not mean to threaten anybody. Please don't don't think that I was trying to threaten anybody. Understood. Thank you. All right. With that, so the next step is, I mean, we've got the election coming up. For all I know, I won't be here. But hopefully I will. Um, I would say the next step is Mr. Mr. Hall, do you have something to well, I could add? Suggest, just to play off uh, Ken's suggestion for continuity, yep. um, we could come up with what I'll call an, an action plan, kind of what's going to happen yep. over the next two to three to four months. And we can uh, add some level of detail in terms of the, the specific steps that will happen. Um, we can bring that to you in a generic form. If you like, you can start to fill in dates. I can tell you, uh, Don and Paul and I have had some success lately with starting to put dates on calendar uh, on the calendar yep. in the future. And that's helpful just to have something to work toward. Yep. It can be modified, but uh, maybe that's uh, an exercise you could undertake. Um, once we put together that, that kind of action plan for your consideration. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Does that Sounds work good. for you guys? Yes. Yeah. Appreciate it. Let's yeah, let's do that. All right. And then, it, and then it gives a, um, um, road work uh, a path forward for whoever's sitting in ordinance yeah. and it's a good report to council it's kind yeah. of a, a interim report yeah. yeah okay i think jay and i can work on putting something together g marie will share it with you and get your yeah. input okay yeah. sounds good all right anything else guys i thought this was a good discussion i mean it was helpful for me to have all of you sitting in one place and for me to think through and and get a feel for where people are coming from, um, because I with I agree with Ken. You know, everyone comes from a different point of view, so it's good to listen and and maybe learn a little bit. And you know, my approach towards things is, you know, if we can take all the sides and put together something that works. Um, then that would be good. And, and we can't avoid the fact that people in town, there's a certain number of people in town who are just freaking out about growth. You know, they think that it's out of control um, and rightly, wrongly, whatever. So let's look at it. Dawn. Yeah, I'm just going to build on your point there in the discussion around timeline. One thing that might help, and I think Paul mentioned this the other night in terms of some documents that we're working with. I mean, if there is a place for us to put uh, all the stuff that Jay has done, you know, has worked up uh, for people to read through. I'm not yes. once so I got to go through it again, but yep. that's it, very helpful. It's context. It's all there. I don't yep. think anything that's, uh, you know, that's yep. uh, particularly confidential, but be, it will really help oh. understanding. Yeah. And I meant to ask Liam, I meant to ask you if you could take what, Dan, uh, what, Dan, what Jay has given us and put it up. Um, you can put it right with the agenda stuff, 
but I'm wondering if there's a place, because I know Paul has talked about having e-files, which makes sense because we do that in my business, um, where people, other counselors can just go in and say, what have they been doing and look at it? Yeah, I think that there's probably a place on, on uh, shared drive we can deposit okay. some things under All the right. subjects, you know, under um, the you know, ordinance committee have specific topics that seem to be coming up. That would be great. And again, whether that's, you know, marijuana yeah. or fireworks or growth management, and that way there's a repository yeah. for the documents. That would be awesome. Yeah, that then, there, there is a, an existing shared Google Drive uh, that we can create folders. Um, yeah. What gets a little more challenging is if you want to share that out publicly, how we organize okay. that that's, so someone can actually make sense of what it is. Right. Because yeah. I'm a big proponent for, we. I just as soon have public access to everything we can, that unless you can't legally, like negotiating or personnel no. or whatever, you know? No, the public has the right to see it. Yeah, they do, but uh, we just have to be thoughtful of how we right. post it and and organize. Right. It. And right. That, that's kind of step two. So let's make sure you all have ready access to this information as we build it out. Yep. And then we can talk about how to share it more widely. Okay. Yep. Okay. I have uh, one last comment, Jay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I want I want to thank Jay. Everybody involved with it. It just and and, and please don't think you know we just. Remember, we re represent the people. People tell us certain things, and all you have to do is look. We have three new candidates. All three candidates. Top item, growth. They didn't make it up. People are telling them that. They're running on it. So it really is a concern of a lot of people. Doesn't mean we're going to shut it down. Doesn't mean we're going to hurt the developers. Somewhere in here, there, there's a balance, like Jean Marie said. Listen to all sides. Let's find a balance in here. And uh, I, I think we can move on. So, but again, thanks again, Jay. Really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know. I can set the next ordinance meeting. Traditionally, we do the third Thursday of the month, which would be November 22nd, if I'm looking at my calendar correctly here. Uh, 19th. 19th, excuse me. Yeah. Um, so why don't we pencil it in? Again, it all depends on what happens right. uh, in a week and a half here. Um, but let's go ahead and pencil it in. In the meantime, I'll work with Tom and Liam on timelines. And stay tuned. Just if I might. Yeah, Jay, go ahead. The 19th is one of the dates that the Long Range Planning Committee is targeting to hold one of their public forums on the comprehensive plan. Oh. Um, so certainly, you know, I recognize you guys usually meet between four and 5.30. My guess is we'd probably start that around six or 6.30. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess I, I just sort of want, I know I'll be preoccupied getting myself ready, but we'll also have already had a couple beforehand. So I'm sure I could participate in an ordinance committee on the 19th. But I just want to yeah, just put that out there for what it's worth. Oh, yeah. I, I think the point is to get something on the calendar uh, that, that can and more than likely will be modified and we'll certainly right. take that into consideration. So let's get it on the calendar right. really to prompt the next committee to get up and running quickly. Right. That's where I was going yeah, with it. Might be just a review meeting. You know? Whatever, yeah. <laughs> bring bring whomever up to date. So um, we start five G. <laughs> don't go, please. Thank you. Anyway, <laughs> do I have a motion to adjourn? I have another meeting at six. Second. Um, and let's have a vote on that, Mr. Hamill. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Ms. Katarina is absolutely yes. <laughs> so thank you everybody for all your input, Rocky and everybody. Um, and we move forward, all right? Thank